Hello, good night. Today, Hello. our guest is Dr. Gary Marks, a respected sociologist, and we're going to be talking about his work on cognitive ability and socioeconomic factors. Dr. Marks, what is the motivating factor behind your research? Um, my motivating factor was that um, I've been involved with um, research in sociology and also policy, uh, people with P's in the OECD, and everyone believes that social, social, socioeconomic status or SES is the kind of dominant uh, predictor or dominant influence on all these outcomes, like whether it's um, school uh, grades, school grades, or how long you stay at school, or what job you get, or your income when you're in your mid forties, um, or your wealth. It's all about SES. It's all about parents' socioeconomic status, and it's not. Um, at all and that's what kind of frustrated me it's been going on for a long long time um it's probably um for at least a century but in a big way since the 1960s um the coleman report which is 1966 was all about i guess inequality in schools and they looked at resources in schools and found that there wasn't um, a big effect or much of effect at all about different resources in schools and this is the 1950s and 1960s and that was their big result, but it gets ignored. So people keep on carping back to SES and uh, resources in schools, resources in the, ha in the home, whether your parents read to you enough or whether you do go to clubs. Um, there's so many little theories uh, about, and it's an industry, um, and the, the bottom line is that SES doesn't have a strong effect on these outcomes at all. And a lot of it to do, is to do with um, um so uh, with um cognitive ability, especially for kids um you know at school their school grades their performance examinations, um, whether they get into the top universities or not, uh, whether they drop out of school, it's mostly about cognitive ability and only a little bit about SES, and that's a kind of um a fact that people like to ignore because it's it doesn't fit into their own kind of view of the world. And there's so much money tied up with grants and uh, research projects, getting students, um, that people believe in SES and they believe it till the day they die. And no matter how much evidence there is, they're not going to um, be dissuaded from that belief. Dr. Marks, you are so correct. And let me expound my point. Resources. Resources are often listed as a primary factor that explains school performance. And resource is important. But guess the type of resource I am discussing. Teacher quality. This is what research showed. I'm sure you are aware. High IQ teachers are able to increase the performance of low IQ students. So if you if you want low performing students to improve their performance, the government must invest in high IQ teachers. So you're right, it's really about cognitive ability and IQ at all levels. Uh, yeah, and those teachers that are high IQ teachers, they prefer to be teaching um, higher level maths and physics or whatever in senior secondary school rather than the low achievers in primary school if you know what i mean if you're a, if you you know a top-notch um teacher who's got an honors degree or a master's degree at a university in physics or chemistry or science some kind of science she's not going to want to teach low achievers so there's that problem as well um for primary school kids, most teachers do okay. And it's like a normal curve. There's some very bad teachers and some very good teachers, but generally teachers get the job done for most kids. Um, there's sometimes there's a lack of synergy between, you know, certain kids and certain teachers, and that happens a lot. But I mean, teachers aren't the magic wand. I mean, we sometimes hear of policy proposals to increase teacher salaries by I don't know, to make them like doctors or something, to teach them by to um, increase salaries by a factor of two or something, saying we'll get a better, a better type of teacher if we did. But all we'll get is the same teachers 
being paid more. That's what will happen. Let's um, say mediocre people will be highly compensated. Countries like Singapore and Finland and Finland pay their teachers well because their teachers are highly educated and competent. Teachers in those countries are drawn from the top cohort of the graduating class. Yes. And there was a argument in Pisa for a long time. That's why uh, Finland did better than average or much better than average than other European countries in the Pisa tests. Uh, you know, the OECD Pisa tests of 15 year olds across the world. And now Finland is kind of not doing as well as it was doing relative to other countries. What countries are doing really well are places like Singapore and bits of China. Um, I don't know if Taiwan's in Pisa. But Japan, kind of Hong Kong, Japan. those countries do well. Hong Kong is doing very well. And some of them have, some of those countries have very large, large classes, which is against the philosophy that's been around for about, I don't know, since the 1970s, that class sizes are too big. So Western governments have reduced class sizes probably from, from about by 10, from about an average of, of 30 to less than 20. And the demographics helps that as well because there's less kids around. But, um, and you don't get it, we haven't got a huge increase in achievement because you've got smaller class sizes. And then some people argue you should have even smaller class sizes that you get down to 10 or something. So, um, which probably would improve student performance a bit, but the cost of it would be enormous to have class sizes of 10 and not to stratify it by ability. And that's another argument is that a lot of the policy people saying, oh, look, you can't stratify um, stratify uh, kids by um, how good they are. So you have this ridiculous situation of middle school science teachers teaching science, physics and chemistry or basic physics and chemistry to kids that are differing by four or five levels of ability. I mean, sorry, class uh, levels, like, you know, from year eight to year 12, that you've got a, a big variation in, in the abilities of the kids. And teachers don't like doing that. It's one thing that teachers prefer to do is to teach homogenous classes because then they can pace it much easier and, and um, have the right level of material for the class. And we also know, Dr. Marx, that school quality is a function of the genetic and cultural potential of students. So Robert Plowman, some years ago, he did research, and this is the conclusion of the research. I at, at the time at the time I I found it to be quite interesting because I'm actually a latecomer to research on cognitive on cognitive ability and IQ. So for years I was familiar with the research, but I did not take it seriously. But I'm taking it seriously now. I mean, why did you take it seriously? Because because there's such a consensus that it's not it's not a viable explanation or that so many people are, are argue against it. I mean, why did you ignore it? Because I did the same, actually. No, I, no. I ignored it because genes seem seem like foreign objects. We know that genes are important, they're part of biology, but the science is always evolving. So at the time, I had a reason to discount the research, not to discredit it, but I discounted the research. But I started to take it seriously because I became older. I did more research. I read the research more analytically. And as a more mature person, I recognize that intelligence matters for many reasons, especially at the country level. So I'm a Jamaican. I'm a Jamaican and I start I've always I've always been interested in economics and the rise and fall of societies. So I started to do immense research yeah. on culture and development and geography geography. And I came to the conclusion that IQ is a major predictor of performance across the boards. And it might sound a bit pessimistic, but it's going to be either impossible or quite difficult to help some countries and some people. So I started to appreciate IQ research because of economics and, and living in a third world country. 
Okay. I mean, I came to it because I felt the, the SES explanations were inadequate. There were so many of them. They didn't seem to explain much. There was so much argument about which SES theory was appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, great industry, like I said before, that people get research grants and PhD students and get promotions based on research into SES. And I always found that kind of unsatisfying and full of holes. Um, same time, I mean, IQ isn't the only explanation. No, not at all. Um, I mean, for kids, it's for, like I said, grades at school or examinations. I mean, IQ is easily the most important. But as you go towards, say, occupational status and what occupations people get, which is mainly through education, but IQ affects education, of course. And then you get to things like uh, income and wealth. IQ has got a, a weaker effect but it still has an effect all the same. Um, and that's also discounted, but it's, it's no kind of full explanation. There's a lot of luck going on, a lot of error going on. Um, uh, so it's not, it's not, doesn't explain everything, but it is a lot more powerful explanation than anything else we've got. And genetics too, um, you know, when they do genetic studies on, on social, sociological outcomes like income, an occupation, they find there's a, a large, um, large, a large amount of the variance explained is because of um, genetics, and they do that various ways. They do it by comparing um, um, different types of twins, the identical and not identical twins. They can compare it. They look at um, adoptees, or they can look at uh, half siblings, full siblings, unrelated siblings, and stuff like that. And they get heritabilities, which is proportion of the variation attributable genetics of 40% for income, which I think is very large um, for something that's so far away from schooling. You know, this is income at age 45, 55. Um, and that, that, that evidence or that kind of whole literature was ignored in sociology and tends to be ignored in economics as well, uh, but not in psychology. Um, and it's, it's a big part of it. To completely ignore it means that people are uh, just um, turning a blind eye to something they don't really understand or want to understand. And so they, their explanations are inadequate when they completely ignore the power of genetics or the role of genetics in these stratification outcomes. Um, they're kind of missing the whole point. They're, they're getting it wrong. Yes. Dr. Marx, we're not going to dwell on this individual, but I'm just going to put it out there for our listeners and perhaps yourself. But Richard Lynn died. Yes, I know. Yeah, uh, I, I did. Yeah, I didn't know, but I discovered some some time ago. Yeah, he died in July. Yeah, maybe yeah. it's a month ago. Yep. Yeah, that's right. And I, I, I consider Richard Lynn to be a pioneer in IQ research because prior to Richard Lynn. Most people did not take IQ seriously, but today we have tons of papers examining the link between IQ and social outcomes. I interviewed him twice, one in print and one on the show some time ago. And he was working on another book to explain achievement differences between men and women. Yeah, controversial topic. Yes, he um, was a controversial man. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, difference between men and women have been around for a long, long time. Yeah. I and mean, you're going back to like the 19, early 1900s when you look at um, IQ distributions for men and women, um, men's distribution is wider. So there's more low IQ men than low IQ yes. women. And there's more high IQ men than high IQ women. And that's a pretty universal finding across the board. And it's been around since, I think, Pearson, which is like the 1900s. You know, Gary, let me oh. make a quick point. So is, is the last book he published was yeah. on was, was about sex differences in intelligence. But the, the book that was never published is compare, it, 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 I guess he was going to call it the glass ceiling. He was trying to explain the disparities in professional advancement between men and women. But he, his latest book is about sex. Is about sex differences in intelligence. Yeah, has that been that you saying that hasn't been published or it was no? The, the sex differences and... that was published. I read it. That, that was, was published, published recently, yeah. like last year, the year before. But the, the the last book he wrote, Glass Ceiling, he died. So I don't know if it was published. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, and this has been, I mean, the, the reaction to Richard Lynn dying is kind of um, a bit nasty. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm not, nobody's writing about it other than some clones on Twitter who don't take science seriously. They're quite rude. But I read mainstream publications, I read dissident publications. Nobody's talking about Richard Lynn's passing. What, even in the journals? Exactly. Nobody's talking oh. about Richard Lynn's passing. Yeah, okay. I mean, there's a little bit I see, but um, you're right. Um, he was, yeah, he was a pioneer and he was very brave to do what he did, actually, because he's talking about not only sex differences, but also country differences and all types of group differences, which get you into a lot of hot water. Exactly. Um, and he did that in the same way as that, um, uh, you know, Hernstein and... Um, yes, Charles uh, you know, Murray. Oh, Charles Murray, I'm trying to think of actually, because uh, Hernstein died quite quite a long time ago. Um, you know, he's he's kept on going, and he gets criticised and and ridiculed and smeared for the last thirty or forty years. But most of what he said in the mid '90s or the bell curve was proved to be correct. Um, and part of my one of my papers or the earlier one was about answering all the critics of the bell curve by saying, oh, look, you know, you haven't measured SES properly, you haven't done this and you haven't done that, um, everything's a bit more complicated, and I did all the things that they said, and you get the same result as they got in the bell curve, is that um, cognitive ability has a much stronger effect than SES on these outcomes, and you can't say that the effects of cognitive ability are because of SES, because it's got a much stronger effect. I mean, you know, I've been motivated by all the critiques that you find that are still going along. You still find people saying that on Twitter or reviewers to papers. They're just kind of parroting what was said in the, in the, in the mid-90s about how they don't like IQ. Um, well, Gary, so, I am a black man. Not that I care much about race, but I guess as a black man, people are going to be more inclined to listen to what I say. Yes, we live in a stupid world. And as I've said earlier, I've read several studies, several books, and the evidence on IQ is really overwhelming. Even on IQ gaps between races, <coughs> it's really overwhelming. Yeah, I try and keep away from that area. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. And you're probably much easier for you to uh, Yes, to you don't need to comment. I can't comment because I'm black. But yes. I, at first, I didn't take it seriously, but there are just so many studies showing us that not only is IQ important, but financial literacy is important, and scores that predict IQ also predict financial literacy and it's linked to patients. So the early, like the, the, the earlier eccentric studies, many of them are proven to be correct. The, the, the new studies are just overwhelmingly pro-IQ and pro-irritability. I mean, I've got a little theory on this. Is why the, um, you know, the area of IQ and genetics is so kind of controversial, and people are so angry about it. And I'm my argument is it isn't about race, it isn't about gender, but it's about people's political ideologies. Is when you start talking about cognitive ability and you're talking about genetic and how people have got genetic influences as a genetic influence on people's outcomes it's undermining political people's political um philosophies or political ideologies because it's saying well there's no blank slate that we're not all the same and that um a kind of socialist utopia that where the government takes control of everything and it makes outcomes equal by social group is not going to happen, uh, is not possible or not feasible, but they don't like hearing that. So that's why they kind of jump all around about race and gender, especially race, because it's very hard for anyone who's not, uh, you know, a black person or whatever to actually make those arguments. Um, so that's my theory, I suppose. That it's I not agree, a I agree. It's about politics. <laughs> Because the whole philosophy of the left-wing parties is that there's a blank slate that we can all we can all achieve, everyone can achieve everything. They can achieve. Everyone can become a nuclear physics physicist if they had the right training or the right you know school or whatever or the right parents or the right resources. And I don't think I'm capable of becoming a nuclear physicist. 
quite frankly. <laughs> Neither am I. Um, Neither am I. And the 10,000 hour rule was debunked. So if you practice for 10,000 hours, they're not going to be Bill Gates. No, you're not. You're not going to be Bill Gates. And Bill Gates was probably very, always a very smart man, but he's also lucky. But um, a lot of these people who are actually, you know, really successful are also really high IQs. Exactly, like and, Mark Zuckerberg. Yes, yes. And also thinking of people who are, um, who are politicians. I like a lot of the kind of politicians that are that are in power at the moment or have been have been um have been um they're at the prize what is it called the um they came on top of their uh like clinton like really yes. high q people uh uh the oxford prize where they road you know, scholarship uh, road scholarships <laughs> yeah how could i not think of that and you know there's so many leaders in, in this country australia we've had I don't know, two or three prime ministers that have had a road scholarship. We've had numerous state premiers that have been had road scholarships. And you may say it's because once you get a road scholarship, it's good on your CV and everyone likes you. You still got to get a road scholarship, and that's the top person in the whole in the whole state. So it's pretty hard to get. Um, so high IQs everywhere, um, and again, it gets ignored. The idea that it's that it's important gets ignored. In fact, we're moving away from it. We're talking about let's let's um, you know let's not have any advanced courses. Not, let's not have any uh, schools that are for kind of high achieving students. Uh, let's get rid of all that because it's racist. Is the argument that's uh, in the US? I don't know if it's in um, the UK yet or not really here, but it's around that argument. Doctor Marx, do you believe in the? efficacy of interventions to boost IQ or academic performance because based on what I have been reading, the evidence does not favor this position. No, and that was probably first said, probably earlier than this, but 1969 by Jensen, who was also smeared and called a racist to this very day. And he was saying that. He was saying that that these are uh, uh, before school interventions or Head Start and all that kind of stuff isn't going to have lasting benefits for IQ. There are initial improvements and then after a while it, it they fade away. There's what they call fade out. And that's been going around since, what, how, he wrote that in 1969. We're now, what, 50 years past that and people yes. are still doing interventions. And I suppose it leads to the question, what do you do with people who have got who are actually not going to perform very well, your low achievers. Say you've got 20% of the population of low achievers and you try and do the best for them. You, you make sure that they can read and write, that they can do mathematics, they can do arithmetic, uh, they understand the world, they've done a bit of history. You can do all that, but they're probably not going to get into your prestigious universities. They're not going to do very well at the end of school in their courses. Um, what do you do? Well, you make sure that there's, there's jobs and opportunities for them. I suppose that's what you can do instead of trying to say, oh, look, everyone should be equal. That's what I've make... said. Yeah, you said that, have you? Okay. Yeah, like I yeah. wrote an art, like I'm a gem, I, I, I'm, I primarily write for foreign publications, but when I'm irritated, I write an article in a Jamaican publication. And I've said that Jamaica, Jamaica's IQ 75.08, spatial skills predict innovation, Jamaicans are technical people. They need to invest in trades and stop wasting time encouraging failing schools to become grammar schools. Yes, that's what I've been arguing here as well. Like, but the the whole policy pushes the other direction. Of course, it's the people to it's for kids to stay in school for longer, you know, till the end of you know till they're seventeen or eighteen, and to do not a variety, of, but not to do specialized courses that everyone does a kind of university orientated type of course they don't do technical subjects there's a bit of a push that way as well or you teach technical subjects at schools by teachers who don't have a background in technical stuff instead of just saying well why don't you get an apprenticeship you know you get a real you get a, a job on the on the site like saying a plumber electrician better to learn how to be an electrician or a plumber on site with a, as a with a master, then learn it at school. We're not going to learn it very well, and that's been my argument for a long time. 
uh, 20 years, I don't think it's had any effect on the policy direction, which is the same same way. It's saying, well, everyone can, can be everything and everyone can go to university and everyone can get a good job out of university. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work like that. Most, look, the average person doesn't even have the ability to read your research paper the one we're going to discuss. Cognitive ability has powerful, widespread, and robust effects on social stratification, evident from the 1979 and the 1997 U.S. National Longitudinal Surveys of Youth. Most people don't even have the ability to read this piece and understand it. No. I mean, most kids or most people don't have the uh, reading ability of a you know middle high schooler as well. So... And that's okay, of course. I mean, you don't have to be a, a someone who understands statistics and all you know all that kind of complicated mathematics. I suppose isn't that much isn't that complicated really? But um, I mean, but people can still do things, and they don't have to be um, they don't have to have they don't have to kind of do physics and chemistry and uh, when they're seventeen to be you know to get a reasonable job. Um, it's to do with the labour market to make sure that people get reasonable jobs. You don't have too much unemployment. That there's flexibility between um, different jobs that, that people can move from one job to the other. Um, there's all those kind of um, policies rather than focus on schools and even kindergartens and say, well, we want everyone to do to, to be uh, an Einstein or everyone to be really successful, everyone to get into medicine or law, become a, a doctor or a lawyer. Um, it's not going to happen that way. And you've got to accept that that we need people who have got technical ex- um, skills as well. We don't want to just um, ignore that. But, um, but, but Gary, education is not the path to wealth creation. Education and human capital are two different variables. So we usually invent technology and then discover the science. What's important is entrepreneurial ability, bringing the product to market. If you're an apprentice, you can get a job and then become an entrepreneur. Schooling does not predict economic growth. <laughs> That's another fallacy. No, no. And um, um, policy direction is also not really very pro-entrepreneur, is it? I mean, small business people tend to get ignored. Entrepreneurship isn't seen as being a, a thing to really... I mean, I can remember um, the Reagan administration talking about entrepreneurs uh, how important it was for um, the US's um, history of, of wealth creation. But um, you don't, it's not really on the political agenda anymore. We don't even hear it from the right wing parties or the right, right of centre parties that we should Im- improve entrepreneurship. We should reduce taxation for small business. We should encourage employment by small business. What you've got is uh, policies would do the opposite. So let's, let's increase the minimum wage. So small businesses can't really employ people let's have all these kind of regulations that say this that you, you know you can't do this and that uh, in employment so you keep on making disincentives disincentives for people to invest and disincentives for small businesses people to to um to employ people so it's kind of going in the wrong direction it's going towards this idea that everyone kind of bureaucratic model that everyone should work in a bureaucracy for the government and you get jobs that way rather than people creating jobs or creating something out of nothing and and creating businesses few research organizations actually focus on low taxation and free trade and many in the conservative community are now are now promoting economic nationalism but i i like the independent institute they have good people but now we're going to talk more about your paper so what's the outcome of your paper what are your findings um, the paper that you talked about, the one about um, cognitive ability, it's based on the uh, the two longitudinal studies, uh, which are fairly famous, the, the American National uh, Longitudinal Study of Youth. There's one in 1979, one in 1997. The 1997, the 1990, the 1979 one was the basis of the bell curve, um, and basically longitudinal study of, of, of adolescents or young adults that follows them every year or every two years uh, until they're in their 60s or, and they're still going. 
And so you can look at the, the effect of the influence of cognitive ability at a, an age when they got tested, which is about 20, a little bit a little bit older for one for, for the first one, a little bit younger for the uh, the second study. And then you can look at well what what, what happens to them when they're you know when they're 30, what kind of education do they have? Uh, what was their highest level of education? You can look at um, uh, their occupation, what's their occupation? Um, what type of occupation? Were they doctors or were they teachers or were they something else? And you can look at their income, their personal income. And you can look at their wealth. Um, wealth is measured in those studies by uh, what assets you have and what debts you have. Um, and so I did those. And it also has a good measure of SES because it has uh, father's and mother's occupation, father's and mother's education. It has family income. And some of it has family wealth. So you've got your full kind of measure of SES, uh, which is a very nebulous concept, actually. And you can just compare that to the effect of ability uh, and address all the arguments that crit criticise the concept of ability, saying it doesn't exist, it's a product of SES, uh, it doesn't have much effect anyway, um, all those kind of arguments. Um, and that's what I did, is I found that, that SES doesn't have much effect when you consider cognitive ability. And everyone's got a cognitive ability and everyone's got an SES, so you can't say they're not comparable. Um, and it's a bit surprising that cognitive ability still has effects on, say, income after you consider uh, educational attainment. So people with the same level of education, highest level of education, the same level, the ones with a higher cognitive ability earn more in their 50s and 60s or 40s, 50s and 60s. Same with wealth. If you, if you um, control for... Uh, education and occupation, the, the occupation they, they got, cognitive ability still has an effect on their wealth. So it's got a, like I said, it's robust, but it's kind of, it permeates all these outcomes. It's robust in the sense that if you, you have a relationship between cognitive ability and say, I don't know, test scores or uh, educational attainment, how many years of education someone has, and the argument is, oh, you know, it must be about SES. And you put in SES, a good measure of SES, and you find the effect of cognitive ability doesn't change very much. It hardly goes down at all. So it's not explained by SES. But the converse is true, that if you, if you have a relationship between SES and, say, years of education, and you put in cognitive ability, the effect of SES goes down a lot. So a lot of the effect of, of SES is to do with cognitive ability, whether that's parents' cognitive ability, it probably is, mother's and father's cognitive ability, and that relationship with the child's cognitive ability. It all gets really complicated, but the bottom line is that SES doesn't have much of an effect at all when you consider cognitive ability. And you also did a paper on cognitive ability and labour outcomes. Yeah, it's the same kind of paper, just a different data set. It's a different, it was the Project Talent, which is this huge project or huge, huge survey they did in the early 60s or 1960 in America. I think they interviewed like 200,000 kids. They got all their results from different, um, you know, different subjects. And they, and then they re-interviewed them 10 years later when they were 29. And so I compared them, that group, 29 with the group of the, the NSLY 79, which uh, which is 19, would you say 1980? So it's about 20 years later, and see if the effect of cognitive ability has changed and SES has changed for the um, between those two cohorts. The results are much the same, except that cognitive ability was less pervasive. It didn't have as much of an effect on later outcomes on income and occupation. Um, uh, so it looks like cognitive ability has become more important for labour market outcomes uh, over time. And it's always been important for educational outcomes. If you go back into the early 1900s and even studies that look at um, schools in England in the 1880s, you still find kind of 
evidence of cognitive ability being really important. I mean, the whole cognitive ability um, enterprise is all about trying to locate kids that or identify kids that weren't going to do very well at school or do and see if they would drop out. And they would, that's why the tests were, were designed. So from the word go, which is like, I don't know, 1904 or something, um, cognitive ability has always had a very strong relationship with educational outcomes. And that's been around. And maybe that happened well before the 1900s. Maybe in any setting where there's education, people are, uh, you know, together learning, like, say, they're, I don't know, in, you know, an Athens school or something, or they're a medieval monk or whatever, and they're, and they're you know, being taught things in schools. The cognitive ability comes out as being important for education. In, in many, many contexts. Gary, and and that's, yep. what are you working on now? What I'm working on now is this guy called Fisher in 1980, 1918, right? Okay. He's a famous kind of genetic person. Yes. He's, actually had a, he's actually been cancelled by a few places because I, th I think there's a place in... Uh, I, I can't remember it's Cambridge or it's Oxford. I think it's Cambridge. I think he got cancelled. A bit like Adam Smith got cancelled. Anyway, he had this kind of uh, idea is that the relationship between, say, parents' education and, and, and child's education or parents' IQ and child's IQ, you can actually predict it by the genetic heritability, which I mentioned before, how much of the, how much how much of the variation of, a, of a, an outcome is due to genetics and how much assortative mating is going on. Assortative mating is, is the kind of relationship between um, mothers and fathers for an outcome, the correlation, if you like, between mothers and fathers' education or mothers and fathers' IQ. And from those two parameters, you can predict pretty well um, the correlation between mothers and, and child's IQ or fathers and child's IQ or mothers and fathers' education and, and uh, their offspring's education. That's what I'm doing now and extending it to occupation and to income. Okay, great. I'm, so when will I be able to read it? <laughs> I don't know. Um, this year, I guess. Okay. And I you think I've been writing. Gary, you see that you're retired, right? Yes. Okay, all right. I'm attached to Melbourne University. Also, when you say you retired, you're retired, what do you mean? Like you're in your 60s, 70s, and you still work? Yeah, I'm in my 60s. Okay, all right. Work. I'm great. I don't work that hard, I guess. <laughs> I don't have much. Um, I suppose I work a bit hard. I, I don't have the problems of being at work when you've got to deal with, um, you know, disputes and, and, you know, clashes of personality and all that kind of stuff. And, so for, for, for your new research on Fisher, do you know somebody called Edward Dutton? Edward what? Dutton. No, D-U-T-T-O-N. No, D-U-T-T-O-N. Yeah, no, I'll look it up. Yeah, he's There's really interesting. Called... He likes, he's a, he's a mentee of Richard Lynn and he has several books and several articles on intelligence. Oh, okay. What's his first name? Edward. Edward. Yes. Okay. There's also someone that you might be interested in called, called Clark. Oh, Gregory Clark, yes. I didn't have a chance oh, to talk Rupert about Clark. You. The one about um surnames and yeah, yeah, Gregory, Gregory Clark. But we have to wrap up now. I've like less than one minute. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, so bye. Okay. All right. All Thank right. you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.